So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Demia Whitaker. I'm a program director within the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to today's session of Diverse Voices, Intersectionality, and the Health of Women. Today's session is entitled Violence in Women, Trauma and Addiction Impacts on Pregnant and Postpartum Women. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items that I want to note for you. Today's meeting is being recorded. We also have live captioning. If you need captioning, please click the closed caption button in the Zoom menu bar to enable captions. Participants will be muted throughout today's session, and if you have questions or questions for either of our presenters, please submit them using the chat function. Feel free to indicate the presenter to whom your question should be directed. I will now introduce Dr. Sarah Timken, the Associate Director for Clinical Research at ORWH, who will deliver a session overview. Next slide, please. The virtual podium is yours, Dr. Timken. Thank you so much, Dr. Whitaker. Globally, gender power imbalances result in physical, sexual, mental, and economic harms for women and girls. Over a lifetime, one in three women and girls will experience physical or sexual violence. This threat increases during times of crisis and instability. Survivors of gender-based violence may experience a cascade of negative short and long-term health consequences. Uh, that range from unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted infection exposures, and physical inju injuries to depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorders, and an increased risk of substance use disorders. That additional, uh, that additional social determinants of health that include race, ethnicity, educational attainment, and socioeconomic status interact with gender to influence these health outcomes underscores the importance of applying an intersectional lens to health disparities research. Both mental health and substance use disorders during pregnancy are a major public health issue in the United States. Untreated mental health and substance use disorders during pregnancy are associated with a host of negative effects on pregnant people. Women have experienced increased social stress during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has amplified their health risks. In addition, social and cultural contexts for women who use drugs vary by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, as well as other factors. Attention to intersectional experiences of women can produce interventions to mitigate risk. Today's session will focus on gender-based violence and addiction during pregnancy and the use of trauma-informed approaches to understand how the multiple marginalizations of women can impact health outcomes. We are pleased to provide a forum to increase awareness of the need for integrated models of care and emergency response programming. Dr. Elizabeth Barr will now introduce our panelists, Dr. Natasha DeJena and Sana Lim. Thanks, Dr. Temkin. Natasha DeJena is an assistant professor of psychiatry and epidemiology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. DeJena studies patterns of commonly used substances in young people and those who are pregnant and parenting. She is currently conducting a study of cannabis and tobacco use in pregnant people under the age of 22 and associated health outcomes in infants. This mixed methods project seeks to center the voices of young pregnant people. Qualitative interviews from the project will enhance understanding of the context of perinatal substance use and child development. Dr. DeJena's research is intersectional, acknowledging interactions among race, sex assigned at birth, substance use, structural racism and discrimination, exposure to violence, and mental and reproductive health. Sana Lim is an associate professor, I'm sorry, an assistant professor who is leading the gender equity and mental health scientific tracks within the Department of Population Health Section for Health Equity at the New York University School of Medicine. As a health disparities researcher, Dr. Lim conducts applied community engaged studies that seek to address gender related health issues among hard to reach populations such as sex workers and immigrant survivors of gender-based violence. 
Her research uses intersectionality and syndemic frameworks, as well as trauma-informed approaches to understand how multiple marginalization impacts mental and sexual health outcomes. Dr. Lim, Dr. Lim is a mixed methods researcher with expertise in psychosocial statistics and survey methods. We'll now transition into the pa panelist presentations, after which Dr. Mia Whitaker will moderate the Q&A session and close the meeting. So welcome, Dr. Natasha DeJenna. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for this opportunity to um, present some of my research with the Young Moms Project. Next slide. This work is funded by the National Institutes of Health and co-funded by the Office of Research and Women's Health. I'm very grateful for this funding and have no other disclosures to, um, to provide. Next slide, please. So first, I just wanted to set the stage for this project, which was funded in 2019. Um, before the pandemic started. Even before the pandemic, this is a time of crisis and upheaval in our country. Uh, people are sick and tired of the racial and gender-based violence. Uh, there's been an increase in hate crimes. There's been civil unrest around the deaths of uh, Black people, Black men in particular, um, trans people of color, people targeted for their race, their religion. Um, so even before the pandemic hit, um, there was this sense that people are starting to really just have enough. Uh, there have been ongoing disparities in health. We've known about this for decades now. Um, this is based in a tradition of generations of racism and discrimination, culminating in these health disparities that we have today that have not gone away, despite the research in the past few decades kind of highlighting these disparities. The pandemic really just exacerbated things and brought again to the forefront how bad things really are in this country. So for example, in the slide here, you see the racial disparity in deaths. So people of color were more likely to become infected with COVID and they were also more likely to die. Uh, next, please. This slide highlights um, maternal mortality rates and it gives you the mor maternal mortality rates as a function of uh, race for black, white and Hispanic people in the US from 2018 to 2020. So right away on the far left of this graph, you could see that really shameful disparity in maternal morbidity. Black people are just significantly more likely to die in childbirth than white or Hispanic people. And you could see that over time in 2019 and 2020, rates for all three groups did increase, um, but the rates really were exponentially much higher in black people. Next slide, please. So, uh, in addition, I want to set the stage with my language as well. Next. You may hear me using the term people a lot, as in pregnant and birthing people, and that's because I want to be more inclusive and, and recognize that not everybody who becomes pregnant and parents identifies as a girl or a woman. Um, the term pregnant women, of course, honors the longstanding work of women in reproductive health and reproductive justice, uh, but I do prefer to use the term people for this reason. Next. This work is grounded in intersectionality, as was mentioned in my introduction, um, and it's also based in or grounded in the principles of reproductive justice. And I think probably many people who are listening to this talk are well aware that reproductive justice is not just abortion rights or contraceptive rights, but it's really the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy, and to be able to raise children in a healthy environment uh, free from violence in safe communities. So we're not just interested in people who are trying to become pregnant or trying not to become pregnant, but really families in general and communities. Now, what's most pertinent to my research that I'm gonna talk about today is uh, reproductive justice states that everyone has the right to be treated with dignity, kindness, and respect as this um, beautiful artwork depicts, no matter what age they choose to parent. And the same is true for people who use substances, people who are struggling with mental illness. Um, you know, no matter what your health status is, you have the right, no matter what age, to decide what to do with your body and when you want to become a parent. And so my work is not to stigmatize younger pregnant and parenting people, but to just learn more about them in such a way that we can help uh, provide the safest pregnancy and birthing experiences and provide any support that they would like. Um, you know, during and after the pregnancy. Next slide, please. So why would I even focus on younger people? I wanted to just uh, 
point out that I'm interested in, as was mentioned in my introduction, on patterns of uh, prenatal cannabis and tobacco use. And so this is the group that really has the higher rates. I think we all know that uh, cannabis or marijuana use has increased. That's true of all age groups. And it's true uh, whether someone is pregnant or not pregnant. There's just been this trend of increasing use over time. Next, please. These data from Kaiser Permanente, where they do universal screening for uh, prenatal cannabis use, demonstrates that it is really more prevalent in people who become pregnant under the age of 25. So those dark lines along the bottom, you see the super subtle increase in cannabis use during pregnancy between the years 2009 and 2016. And the brightly colored lines across the top are the people who are under the age of 25. And you can see that they're really driving the increase in prenatal cannabis use in this country. This is, of course, just data from California, but we also see uh, the same in the national data sets that have been analyzed as well, such as the National Survey of Drug Use and Health and the PRAMS data sets and so on. And so that's why in my work, I'm really focusing on much younger people because I'm interested in understanding, you know, who is using cannabis and tobacco while pregnant, the context of that use and the implications for that person and um, their baby if they choose to deliver. Next, please. So this forms the basis for the Young Mom Study, which is a mixed methods project um, with a longitudinal component. So you could see here time one of the far left of the slide, just to orient you. Uh, we do try to recruit people at their first OV visit as po if possible. Uh, we have very few exclusion criteria. Uh, everyone under the age of 22 who is not in active treatment for opioid use disorder is recruited into the project. Uh, we would like to see people at each trimester of pregnancy and four and six to 12 months postpartum. You can see that we have a variety of, of methodologies. We use online and iPad surveys. We collect biospecimens. We conduct interviews by Zoom and telephone and in person. We do infant assessments uh, six months postpartum. And along the bottom, those little boxes uh, with the interviews, uh, that, that say interview are just supposed to demonstrate that there's a qualitative component as well. Where we're talking to people at different stages in their pregnancy and in the postpartum time period to learn more about the context of their substance use and how their delivery experiences were uh, went. Next, please. So this slide just gives you a snapshot of some preliminary data from the baseline survey. And you can see here uh, the percentages of people reporting different types of substances. So along the left-hand side, you can see that 13% are reporting cigarette use while pregnant. 6% are reporting little cigars and cigarillos. 11% vaping nicotine specifically. Um, and almost 30% reporting that they are using cannabis while pregnant. So you can see that this is really a good uh, cohort to study prenatal tobacco and cannabis use because right off the bat, we're seeing high rates. And I would like to remind you that I do not recruit specifically for substance use. We're just recruiting anybody that's coming into the uh, clinics that we're affiliated with and asking them to participate. And we're seeing very high rates of substance use, very low rates of alcohol use, um, however. Next. This is some preliminary data on urine samples that are provided to healthcare providers that we screen for levels, or we screen for THC and, and cotinine or you know, tobacco and cannabis use. You know, and these data do not provide uh, you know, any inkling of what people are using, how they're using, how often, how recently they've used, but they do give you kind of an idea of the exposure. And you could see again, about half, again, we're not recruiting for substance use, but half of the sample is positive for cotinine and THC. Next, please. This is a little snapshot of the demographics. You can see that on average, they're just shy of 20 years old. We're pretty successful recruiting in the first trimester, the average weeks pregnant, 10 weeks for the first survey. Um, and they're about 60% first pregnancy, 40% have been pregnant before. And I wanna highlight here that these are young people, many of whom have multiple marginalized identities. So you could see that two thirds of the sample have identified as black or biracial, and one third of the sample has identified as a sexual or gender minority, it's primarily sexual minority, I will say, uh, with the most common group being bisexual. Uh, but we have very high rates of sexual minority uh, status in the sample. Now, when we look into uh, retrospective data in large national data sets, we do see that people who are sexual and gender minorities 
report that they are more likely to have an adolescent pregnancy. Uh, so that's consistent with what we're seeing here. And then there have been some uh, analyses recently of large national data sets that have uh, you know, kind of pulled out now that we have people reporting sexual minority status on those um, surveys, that they are uh, more likely to use tobacco and perhaps cannabis, although that has only been reported in one study. But there is no data on prenatal substance use in this young population. Um, we do think that they might be at risk of prenatal substance use for various reasons, including the fact that uh, sexual and gender minority youth are at high risk of taking up substances and continuing to use them over time. Um, and they have a lot of risk factors for prenatal substance use. And we think that it's not because you're a sexual minority that that identity somehow confers risk for substance use per se, but that it's embedded within the context of a syndemic. And it looks like Dr. Lim's also gonna be talking about syndemics today, but basically overlapping epidemics that are um, in vulnerable groups that promote substance use partnered with things like exposure to violence and depression. So those are the factors that we're looking at in this sample. Next. This slide shows you the rates of reported intimate partner violence. And in this case, in our survey, we have really only the most extreme forms of violence. We have physical and sexual assault by an intimate partner. On the left side of the slide, you can see it's lifetime rates, 30% in our sexual and gender minority compared to 16% in those who are completely heterosexual. And on the right side of the slide, it's recent or past three months experiences. And you could see that one out of 10 of the young pregnant sexual minority people in this sample have reported that in the past three months, they have been phys physically or sexually assaulted. So again, very high rates of exposure to violence that kind of fits in the pattern of a syndemic. Next, please. In terms of mental health, uh, depressive symptoms were higher. You could, it's a small difference, but it was statistically significant in our sexual and gender minority people. Um, and there were no differences in levels of stress reported by our non-sexual gender minority and our sexual gender minority participants. Next, please. Uh, in terms of prenatal substance use, the sexual and gender minorities were significantly more likely to report weekly tobacco use during pregnancy. And there was no statistically significant difference in cannabis use. Now, what's interesting is when we put these differences into multivariate models and we included syndemic factors like the higher rates of exposure to violence, intimate partner violence that we saw, the higher depressive symptoms, um, they have lower rates of social support. Those things did not attenuate or explain these differences in prenatal tobacco use that we're seeing in our sample as a function of sexual minority status. Um, and in fact, the, it remains significant even when we control for their age, when we control for household members who are smoking uh, and using tobacco products in the home and for cannabis use, which is very strongly correlated with tobacco use in this sample as in others. Um, so there definitely seems to be a very strong link between sexual minority status and tobacco use in this group. And it's something that we see in non-pregnant populations as well that seems to be carrying over into the prenatal populations and so, you know, we have very young people who are setting themselves up for tobacco-related um, health problems down the line, as well as the well-known effects of prenatal tobacco exposure. So that's very concerning and something that we'd like to get at the bottom of. Next. So what we have also uh, that we are going to analyze soon is an additional survey, but we're trying to see if there are other factors that might explain these differences. So things that we're looking at are experiences of discrimination, child abuse and neglect and bullying that we think may help explain some of these differences so that we can try to identify some um, targets for intervention if possible. And we're also going to the experts uh, in this case, the people with lived experience now, and we are interviewing um, young pregnant people who identify as sexual minorities to better understand the context of their substance use during and after pregnancy, and also just to hear about how their healthcare experiences have been as a person with these kind of multiple marginalized identities, and if they feel they're being treated differently because of their age, their race, their sexual orientation, um, and or their substance use. Uh, next. I'm gonna pivot now and talk a little bit about some qualitative work focusing on the black and biracial participants. And with this study, um, and I must say as a disclaimer, I'm fairly new to qualitative research. I spent um, you know, a couple decades doing quantitative work and admiring qualitative work and uh, you know, what you can learn really 
uh, from that kind of research and have uh, only recently in the past five or six years become more involved with mixed methods work. And I think now I'm slowly coming around to doing it the right way, which is starting with the qualitative piece and using that to better understand the quantitative data. So in this study, we started with our interviews. We interviewed 25 people um, about structural racism and discrimination, just in life in general, as well as in their um, medical encounters, obstetric racism specifically, and any changes in substance use uh, with regards to the pandemic. Next, please. Uh, and so I want to present just a few of the themes that have come out of those interviews, because I think that our participants were so candid, so articulate, and were really truly amazing um, about sharing their experiences with the, us, many of them painful. Um, and I think we can all learn a lot from their words. Next, please. Here's some quotes that um, demonstrate that these people are really aware of disparities in maternal morbidity and care uh, for black versus white and other race and ethnicities, and that they were concerned that their healthcare providers were not taking those fears seriously. So here's one person who said, I was reading an article that like women of color, when they go through pregnancy, like a lot die, and some medical providers don't take their problems serious. Next. This person said, I was scared the whole time, and I just feel like I was being treated like I wasn't there. Like they knew I was scared and stuff, and they were just doing a lot of things like talking to themselves, not letting me know what they were doing before they were doing it. So here we also get a sense of a lack of autonomy, bodily autonomy, in terms of what was going around, around her during her prenatal care and birthing experiences. Next. Our participants acknowledge the historical roots of racial discrimination in healthcare. Um, so for example, this person said, I wish they would really sit down and go back into history and look back at where black women came from. We came from being slaves at one point in our lives and being raped by slave masters. Stuff did get better. Still separation between, oh, because my skin is too dark, I'm not pretty enough, or, oh, my baby's not going to be taken care of that much in the hospital as a white woman's would. So real awareness of the historical roots of racism medical racism, obstetric racism, and understanding how that might have an impact on their current care today. Next. Um, in continuing with this theme, another quote about the uh, impact on current care. Uh, and this is a, acknowledging the roots of sci and scientific racism. So an idea for a long time that like black people felt like or could tolerate pain better than white people. And it leads into the healthcare like situation now people not listening to black women when they say they're in pain or this is what they want to do. Next. And this also had an impact on patient provider communication and what our participants felt comfortable talking to physicians and other healthcare providers about. I feel like people of darker skin color, we have a hard time expressing what we want because then we come off as greedy or asking for too much, stuff like that. I've never been able to go into a doctor's office and be like, hey, this is how I feel. This is what I think's going on. I feel like if we go to doctors, we're more likely to be gaslit than we are to be attended to. Next. So the themes uh, and the quotes that I've shown today really demonstrate how very young people who are pregnant or postpartum, black and biracial people, they understand the historical roots and the continued outcomes of racial discrimination in healthcare and in their prenatal care. They're conscious of how those factors continue to influence their own care. And they're aware of these health disparities and they're frightened and rightfully so uh, for, them, uh, for their pregnancy and their delivery experiences. Next. And we saw at least in one of those quotes how you know discrimination, the power dynamic between the healthcare provider and the very young person with multiple marginalized identities and internalized racism in some cases may promote self-censoring during interactions. So people don't feel comfortable expressing their concerns, asking for information and disclosing things to their providers. Next. Now, unfortunately, today I don't have the opportunity to share all the amazing quotes that I have, but I will share some of the themes, other themes that we're seeing in this research. Next. One was how racial discrimination was related to assumptions about substance use in this population and pressure about family planning and contraceptive decisions. So again, with around autonomy and lack thereof. Next. Uh, we asked about the pandemic and we found out how uh, that just introduced new stressors 
and people were afraid of being infected, afraid of how it was going to impact their uh, pregnancy, delivery, and their infants. Uh, we found that the difficulty finding childcare made it impossible for people to attend prenatal visits regularly, and they were not able to have support people present either in their prenatal care or in their uh, birthing rooms. Next. We also heard a lot about pressure to get the COVID vaccine, even after people uh, stated pretty clearly that they were not interested at the time, that they were waiting for more information about it. And, you know, keeping in mind that uh, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of data on pregnant people and the implications. And we also heard how their vaccine hesitancy was related to that historical legacy of scientific and medical racism. And people told us very frankly that they didn't want to be guinea pigs. You know, they were aware of Tuskegee and other um, you know, racist experiments in history, and they didn't trust the medical or scientific community to have their best interests at heart. Next, future directions with this, uh, uh, with this part of the study next include a survey, and we have a survey that we've developed that looks at discrimination next, and obstetric racism, uh, among other things, um, and how those might have an impact on substance use and disclosure to providers. But uh, we're also looking at the themes from this qualitative work right now and adapting the survey to be responsive to what we're learning from our experts, our people with lived experience. Next. Finally, uh, I want to move in a direction of language equity, and I was recently funded to, to bring an element of language equity to the Young Moms Project, which currently only recruits people who can speak and read enough English to complete our surveys and provide informed consent. And so in Pittsburgh, we have an emerging Latina community, and in this kind of a community, which doesn't have a historical large population of Latina people, what you find is that there's less uh, um, structural things in place. It's harder to have language accessibility. And there are many reasons why people might have more difficulties having a healthy and safe pregnancy and parenting experience. So we really want to uh, be more inclusive going forward in our research endeavors and, in our, and provide the best possible information we can, not just to our patients and our participants, but also to our healthcare providers that are genuinely interested in providing the best healthcare for their patients. Next. So I think my time is just about up. And I wanted to acknowledge, first of all, the Young Moms participants, who, as you can see from these quotes, have been just truly amazing and have taught us all so much about their experiences with healthcare and um, so many things. So we're very grateful for their participation and their candor, um, as well as all the people that you see here on the slide who have been instrumental in collecting, analyzing these data. Um, and helping the work get funded. So uh, it definitely takes a village to do this kind of work. So thank you very much for your time. That was the last slide, thank you. Dr. Lim, the virtual podium is now yours. Good afternoon, thank you so much for having me. So today I'll be talking about understanding and addressing gender-based violence among Asian American women through an intersectional lens. Next slide, please. So COVID-19, while there is a strong historical precedent, really kind of gave rise to additional violence specifically targeted towards Asian women. Most notably, March of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, eight women were shot in, in the Atlanta spas by uh, by a white man, uh, six of whom identified as Asian women. Uh, in New York City specifically, where I am, uh, earlier this year, a, a Asian woman was followed and fatally stabbed in her Chinatown apartment. Uh, another Asian woman was killed uh, by being pushed onto the subway tracks. And this is just um, three of many, many recent examples of the rising violence uh, targeted towards specifically against Asian women. Next slide, please. And so what the intersectional kind of component is what we call gendered racism against Asian women. So Mukamala and colleagues here, if you look at the right side of the screen, so there's racism experienced as an Asian American and then there's sexism uh, experienced as a woman. And so this racism and sexism when it combines creates kind of this multiplicative effect and so Asian women are, are viewed, what, how this shows up is that Asian women are viewed often as sexually and otherwise submissive, cute, small, and exotic, passive, in other words, not a great leader. 
Next slide, please. So this is a rather crude, uh, but for me, a very kind of um, relevant example. Uh, movie Full Metal Jacket in 1987 uh, shows a scene in which Marines are propositioned by a Vietnamese sex worker. Me so horny, me love you long time. And this line was later sampled by the hip hop group Two Live Crew in a song named Me So Horny, which reached number one in the, in the US Billboard Hot Rap Tracks in 1989. And so if you're from my generation or otherwise, I um, am catcalled um, or at a bar quite often. And Me So Horny, Me Love You Long Time is something that I am personally uh, called out on all the time. Um, next slide, please. And so this type of gendered racism, intersectional marginalization among Asian American women, and, and that really contributes to vulnerability to gender-based violence, lack of targeted outreach and participation in national and otherwise kind of studies of violence, under-reporting, decreased access to culturally and linguistically appropriate services, lack of perceived kind of self-perceived need for and underutilization of services, and worse than physical and mental health equally related to gender-based violence. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of kind of the lack of data among Asian American populations. This is true of not just violence, but of most health uh, data. So the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey is the main kind of surveillance mechanism in our country to currently document the prevalence of different types of violence. And so in 2010, there were approximately almost 7,000 uh, women in the sample. If we look at where that arrow is pointing, API, which stands for Asian Pacific Islander, there are no estimates for rape. And this is also true that there are no estimates for intimate partner violence, sexual and physical. And so the report states that the case counts of other racial ethnic categories of women were too small to report stati statistically reliable estimates. And so a lot of sources, including NISPA, say that Asian women have the lowest her kind of lowest proportion, lowest prevalence of reported different types of sexual and physical violence compared to other race ethnicities. But in some cases, there are not even estimates. Uh, next slide, please. We conducted a systematic scoping review on non-partner sexual violence recently, uh, not just among Asian American, but also including Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations. And so what we really found was that there's no disaggregation across the kind of diverse Asian subgroups, meaning that everything is combined into the Asian category often, especially with national data. Often it's combined with the other category, so Asian and other. Um, and there's almost non-existent data on multiply marginalized API populations, so sex workers, for example, sexual gender minority Asians. There are almost, I think there was one or two, so lack of studies on effectiveness of interventions. And there were two studies in the entire scoping review with, a, with an explicit intersectional framing. Next slide, please. And so I wanna talk about uh, one of the studies I conducted among sex, Asian sex, sex, sex trafficking survivors in New York City. Uh, next slide, please. And so unlike, I, I'm not gonna focus on one particular study today. I really do wanna show you kind of the breadth of research that is happening. Um, only because I feel that we're so under-researched and I want to get in as much as possible. Um, so if we think about the intersectional identities of, of Asian sex trafficking survivors, most of them are trafficked through massage parlors uh, in, in the U.S. Um, and uh, the, in New York City, there's uh, most of them identify as Chinese Korean or Chinese Korean. Um, and so uh, the danger of uh, making this Venn diagram is that you leave out a lot of other intersectional identities, of course, but the most prominent ones, particularly for this uh, group, is immigrant status, gender, race, and class. Uh, next slide, please. And so our study sought to understand factors influencing recovery and well-being among Asian survivors of sex trafficking, and they had to identify as Korean or Chinese and considered a sex trafficking survivor based on the service provider organization's definition. So we used a convenient sample. This is a very difficult to reach population for many, many, many reasons. Um, sex work is criminalized. Um, and so uh, the key thing was that we partnered, this is a, a community-based uh, participatory research study. So our community partner in the study was Sanctuary for Families, one of the largest gender-based uh, violence organizations on the East Coast with a specific anti-trafficking unit. 
Um, and I used to work there a very long time ago as a case manager for trafficking survivors. Uh, so this study is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, we used a mixed methods approach. So uh, we did a self-administered survey in Korean and simplified Chinese. This is actually currently ongoing. Um, and what we don't talk about here today is that we received a supplement to work with uh, Latina survivors of trafficking as well. Um, and then we uh, conducted in-depth interviews with survivors and service providers. Next slide, please. And so I'm just going to focus on the qualitative results today. Um, so really thinking about kind of the intersectional identities again in terms of class, we see a lot of poverty and debt. So an attorney said, even when we're able to get the work authorization and get them access to housing for a year, we're not paying off the debts that drove them here. Some large amount of money is owed to somebody at home. And if they're not able to pay it off, either the home situation is getting worse or family are getting threatened. That's a huge mental pressure and financial stress for our clients. Next slide, please. And then this kind of lack of employment opportunities and all these uh, kind of themes that I talk about are interrelated to one another. Uh, so another attorney said they've gone back to places where they know customers will require them to perform sexual services. Financial desperation is one of them. There are not many other options for them. Mental health counselor said, working in these massage parlors, they make the most money out of all of these other jobs. For example, nail technician, waitressing, working in hotels, but massage parlor work from what I'm told by my clients bring in a lot more. Next slide, please. Housing insecurity and the sense of hopelessness. A survivor, a Korean survivor said, I feel so pathetic because I don't even have my own home and I stay at my boss's house. It is so sad. At least I'm happy that I have somewhere to go, a place to sleep. But at the same time, I feel pathetic because I don't even have a space for myself. I basically returned to the same situation where I was when I first came to the US. Of course, now I have a visa and a car, but I don't know where to go or what to do. I feel lost. Next slide, please. And with intersectionality, the field is really moving towards emphasizing not just the multiple marginalization, but the resilience that comes with intersectional identities. So I really want to make sure I highlight that here. One Korean survivor said, I couldn't even speak English, so I had never taken the subway. I bought a subway map and I ran around the subway all day so I could memorize the subway lines. Next slide, please. Uh, so doing a whirlwind tour of kind of some of the studies. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a study that I conducted uh, with South Asian young adult survivors of sexual violence. Uh, next slide, please. And so the, the impetus for the study, uh, it was really community initiated and led. At the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of sexual assault disclosures in certain circles uh, in social media um, in New York City. And they were naming their perpetrators. And then there was a huge backlash from community members, both from the leaders themselves, as well as from um, a lot of other folks on social media. And just witnessing this at the height of the pandemic, kind of at the beginning of March and April of 2020, uh, two young South Asian students approached me and said, I, we would really like to do a needs assessment. And so uh, organically, a kind of advisory board formed of young South Asian women they were involved in all stages of the study and they created this lovely flyer um, for, the, for the survey that we conducted and they have their own logo as well and they're still going very strong in terms of their participation in other studies. So the broad aim was to understand factors influencing sexual assault, help seeking, disclosure and mental health outcomes among South Asian young adults in, New York, in the New York City area. And so you have to identify a South Asian and residing kind of in the New York City area, so state of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and between the ages of 18 through uh, 34. Next slide, please. And so again, this is leaving out a lot of other identities, um, but the kind of most prominent ones for our study population were religion, race, ethnicity, and sexual identity. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at kind of some of the main characteristics. So if you turn your eye to the far right side of the screen uh, for the bars, so we see a uh, pretty high lifetime prevalence of various types of sexual assault among approximately 335 uh, uh, persons. And so at the far left, you see almost the entire sample had experienced no contact sexual assault, 75% contact, 45% rape. Uh, and multiple rape defined as more than three times in their lifetime at 
And so, yes, this is not, this is a convenient sample. The goal of the study was not to get a representative sample. Um, and then, so we found that perpetrators were primarily South Asian at 65% or family members at 25%. Only 28% indicated they had reported assaults to authorities or received services. And the majority at 69% reported moderate to severe, uh, de severe depressive symptoms. Next slide, please. And so kind of highlighting the main results here, among all survivors, help seeking was higher among participants who had a family member as a perpetrator and had lower stigma related to sexual assault disclosure. Uh, um, so we had a high sample of LG, LGB plus, lesbian, gay, bi plus uh, participants, uh, so 24% of the sample. And compared to their heterosexual counterparts, uh, sexual minority participants were at higher odds of depression, which, which certainly aligns with the literature. Uh, among Muslim survivors, uh, higher religiosity was associated with lower odds of reporting depression. So here again, we see how intersectional identities is not always about marginalization, but it's complex and it, and it, and it embeds both, both a sense of resilience as well as marginalization. Next slide, please. Um, so just wanted to end here with some projects in the works. Um, we have a R01 application pending. It's a culturally adapted multi-level intervention to improve mental health outcomes among Asian college women in New York City. And it's through explicitly addressing intersectional stigma. And this is the, the institutional level intervention is focused on working with college providers and, and kind of college providers and faculty members to uh, do anti-stigma training. We have an R34 application that's pending and it's a culturally adapted multi-level intervention to increase HIV testing among Asian female sex workers and massage parlors in New York City, again, by explicitly addressing intersectional stigma. Here, we're working with healthcare facilities uh, in terms of anti-stigma training and kind of anti-stigma policies. And then we currently have an Asian Women in Safety survey um, um, that's ongoing. So it's a national online survey to assess Asian women's experience of intersectional discrimination, mental health, and safety concerns. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Thank you both um, actually for uh, presenting for us today. Now we're going to transition into um, uh, some question and answer sessions so we can have some engagement with the audience. Um, and so we'll begin with a question to Dr. DeJenna. Um, one of our audience members mentioned, I applaud the focus on pregnant people and acknowledge and the acknowledgement that some pregnant people don't identify as women or girls that may not be in heterosexual relationships. At the same time, how do how do you or we create spaces that acknowledge these identities and at the same time honor that some pregnant women really value the term women um, as part of pregnancy? Dr. DeJenna, thoughts? Yeah, I actually did not answer that question in the chat because I think it's a really tough one. And I think that's, and that's why I acknowledged in the beginning uh, about language, because I think it's something, you know, first of all, we have to be more aware of our language and how we might be hurting or excluding groups of people um, and trying to meet people where they're at and address them with the pronouns and the, the signifiers that they are comfortable with. You know, and it's, it's funny because even in the survey, talking to one of my collaborators while we were, um, you know, designing one of the surveys and in, in previous studies, they had used things like, uh, you know, really gendered things about the baby, uh, asking questions like, are you excited to have a boy or a girl? And I really wanted to get away from that. But I can acknowledge that my collaborator, that was an exciting part of their pregnancy and that they had experience with a lot of people who identified as moms and mothers and who wanted to buy the pink or the blue. Uh, and, you know, so we do need to be mindful and respectful of people's choices and what makes them happy and excited about this, you know, wonderful time in many people's lives. Um, and, but how to do that and be inclusive, I actually don't have the answer for that. Thank you. 
so much for sharing that. Um, the, the next question we'll um, uh, start with, um, of course, begins with additional kudos to you both for your wonderful presentations. Um, and then the uh, writer also mentions, um, could either of you talk more about how we can strengthen our healthcare systems emergency response for marginalized uh, populations at risk for pregnancy or, or sexual trauma and gender-based violence? Um, so uh, why don't we start with you, Dr. Lim, and, and then Dr. DeJena, you can add anything additional you'd like to um, share. So if I'm understanding correctly, this is specifically around the healthcare system. I know that providers are extremely overburdened, especially in the context of COVID-19, but their point of entry for identifying survivors of violence, really, they are best suited often <laughs> uh, to identify survivors and, and refer uh, for various services. Um, for example, currently for sex trafficking survivors, the point of identification usually happens when they are, when there's a massage raid, uh, parlor raid, or, or they're uh, charged for prostitution. So they're coming through the legal system, through the courts, and then being referred, which is not a great process. And so, yes, I would love for healthcare systems to be strengthened. And that said, that would require some political will um, on the healthcare system side to be able to train uh, medical folks, and that kind of ties into medical education as well, right? Because um, very few folks feel, for example, providers are surveyed and they don't feel comfortable talking about or are even screening for violence. Um, and so that would be great if providers could have non-judgmental, empathetic conversations around violence and kind of identifying when they come in with a partner, for example, that might be a potential abuser and, and kind of having these mechanisms in place to safely allow women to speak. Um, and then one thing I wanted to add was is that we always talk about planting the seed in the gender-based violence field. So even if they're not identified right away, uh, just providing resources over multiple encounters is always a great start as well. Thank you. And Dr. Dejana, anything you'd like to add? I, I will say that it's hard uh, when providers are so overworked and um, have limited time and staffing in our hospital system right now is not great. And so they're even more overburdened and overwhelmed. And you can see that you know, in our interviews that there is the distrust and, um, and that I think plays into disclosure as well. And unfortunately in research studies as well, I think we're actually underestimating the prevalence of violence in our studies. Um, for one thing, not just because people are not comfortable disclosing in a survey, even after we assure them that we're not sharing this information with their healthcare provider or anyone else, but the fact that people are not even entering into a study if they are feeling unsafe in many cases. And we do suspect that that's the case. And what we're seeing here is an undercount of trauma and violence. Thank you. So that brings me to a question um, uh, about the, the syndemic informed strategies um, in general. Um, syndemic informed strategies really can sort of enable us to simultaneously um, uh, tackle some of the co-occurring um, and macro level um, risk factors um, that are, are affecting um, uh, uh, SGM populations and populations of women who face um, multiple marginalizations. So um, are, are there ways in which you can think of or, or share um, your thoughts on how we can go about creating those multi-level strategies that are needed to address the both trauma, addiction, and mental health um, issues that place women at greater risk or, or uh, women in, in SGM populations at greater risk of, of violence to include gender-based violence? If that's for me, I am only slowly hoping to move into intervention work in the coming year. Um, so I am not very well versed in interventions. Um, I do think an underlying theme that we see with a lot of those factors is depressive symptoms. And one thing about people is that they may not be in a place in their life where they are able to or willing to tackle the substance use, right? It's very difficult to stop smoking when you have multiple intersecting factors and traumatic experiences bearing down on you, it is very difficult to give up something that will temporarily make you feel better. 
uh, people are even less motivated to quit using cannabis in many cases, right? So one thing people can agree on though is they wanna feel better in general. And so I think that might be a point of entry is trying to address depressive symptoms. Everybody wants to feel better. Everybody doesn't wanna, you know, who is struggling with depression does not wanna feel this way. And so I think in some places that's a way we can meet people where they're, they're, they're motivated to try to bring some change into their life. And the hope there is that that will, you know, it's not going to address the factors why they are depressed, you know, the gender-based violence, the structural racism, discrimination, the trauma, the violence that they're truly experiencing, you know, we need policy level changes to affect that. But in terms of what we can do as healthcare providers and, and scientists who are studying these things, you know, I think depression, if you're just talking one-on-one -on -one with people, that might be a way of influencing substance use by reducing depressive symptoms. And then hopefully in that way, um, we can address some of these things. And I, get, I think they need to be culturally relevant to the population, whether that's sexual gender minority uh, or racial specific ethnic group. Yeah, Thank and you. if I can add to that, you know, the field is really moving towards more structural level interventions. Well, multi-level, right, individual plus. And so, I mean, ideally, if I had a magic wand and I was a competent researcher enough to propose a structural intervention that I could successfully measure and implement, <laughs> um, I would love to address the kind of root causes that, you know, the whole premise of this endemic is that they share these root structural causes. And so if we can address the kind of the, the, the low education, the, the low socioeconomic status, the struggles that people face every day that really shape all these kind of endemics in the first place, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, very much so well said. Um, well, now we are, are sort of reaching the end of our hour. We want to thank uh, both of our uh, amazing colleagues for their uh, presentations today. Um, I, along with my ORWH colleagues, would like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters, Dr. Natasha DeJena and Sana Lim, the CIT support team, the ORWH communications and operations staff, as well as the universities represented here in their communication staff, and you, the attendees of today's Diverse Voices session. Um, we want to encourage and support uh, pregnant and birthing persons and survivors of gender-based violence um, and pursue innovations in healthcare and research and policy um, to provide the critical care um, that's necessary to improve their health and safety in the United States and abroad. We welcome the ongoing partnership with the large community in the in this work um, to advance both health care and health equity um, for all populations of women. Um, please save the date for our next session of Diverse Voices, which will take place on January 26, 2023, and it will focus on cancer disparities, methods, and measurement of racial and ethnic diversity. A link to the registration page is included in the chat. Please feel free to share this info with your networks broadly. All registrants will also receive from today's event, um, a webinar recording in, in the post-event email. Um, for additional information on ORWH's efforts to promote equity-oriented research in women's health, please go to our website, nih.gov women. This concludes today's session, and we want to thank you for participating. We look forward to an, uh, an additional engagement in the future. Thank you again for joining us. The webinar has now concluded.